Wesleyan tradition. And so I thought that would be good. And so ever so often when they complete a commentary, they send me the commentary. And, and so I was, I was pretty excited, especially since this year we're looking through the prophets. And so uh, I got this commentary uh, from Isaiah uh, chapter 1 through chapter 39. That's good. Step four, the book of Isaiah has 66 chapters in it. You ever felt like you get cheated sometimes? <laughs> you know, let's just cut some of the stuff out, right? So we don't have to, we don't have to uh, read the other parts from 40 to 66. But uh, the book of Isaiah is actually, most scholars uh, will say that the book of Isaiah is divided up. Uh, some scholars would say that it's divided right down the middle uh, from chapter 33 to uh, 1 to 33 and then 34 to 66. But most of the scholars would believe that Isaiah is actually uh, a collection of three books. Isaiah uh, chapters 1 through 39. Uh, second Isaiah would be chapter 40 through 54. And third Isaiah would be chapter 55 through 66. Well, when I got the commentary and you notice it's Isaiah chapter 1 through 39, which would indicate that the Wesleyan tradition holds to the, the view that there's three, uh, chapter 1 through 39, chapter 40 through 44, uh, 54, and then chapter 55 through 66. And so I, the reason I bring that up is because it's significant in the fact that I wanted you to turn to Isaiah chapter 40, which means Isaiah chapter 40 is at the beginning of the second book or the second Isaiah. Uh, which is, 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 is significant. Uh, it's significant because Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1, says that the vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah son of Amos saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Now, the reason that's important is because there were, there were more kings that came uh, after King Hezekiah. There's more kings of Judah that come after King Hezekiah. In fact, there are seven more. Uh, Hezekiah is not the last king of Judah. There are seven more that comes after uh, Hezekiah, and those seven kings will reign 125 years in Jerusalem, and then Judah is taken to Babylon for 70 years. The reason that's significant is because chapters 37, 38, and 39 are about the end of the life of Hezekiah. And so Isaiah chapter 1 says that it goes, this vision goes from the beginning of uh, uh, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and all the way to Hezekiah. Well, the life of Hezekiah comes to an end at the end of 37, 38, and 39. And so when we get to Isaiah chapter 40, it's, it's a brand new backdrop. It's a brand new scenery. Everything has changed. Uh, and that's what happened. This is where Isaiah uh, chapter 40 begins. Uh, so seven more kings have come by, 125 years, and probably about 70 years of the captivity there in Babylon. So you're talking 195 years since Isaiah 39. We have a brand new, brand new book, Isaiah chapter 40. Okay? So in that, Isaiah chapter 40, it opens up with these words. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard services have been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. A voice of one called. In the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. You see, what has happened is everybody from chapter 39 is dead. Everybody that had anything to do with what's going on from 139, they're gone, they're dead. 195 years have passed, and the world has changed. Things are different in Isaiah chapter 40. But in the middle of captivity, in the middle of Babylon, we hear the message of hope. God is coming to help us. 
God is coming to help us. And so our job is we have to prepare the way for the Lord because the Lord is coming to help us out here. John the Baptist was the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1 through 3. But today, we have to prepare our hearts for Christ to come again. That's, that's the good news about Isaiah chapter 40. And that's what that, that message means to you and me. That in the midst of darkness, when everything in our world has changed, there's this message of hope. The Lord is coming to help. We need to prepare ourselves for his coming. So that's, that's, that's kind of the backdrop of what's taking place in Isaiah chapter, Isaiah chapter 40. Now, with your Bibles open, Isaiah chapter 40, I want to read from verse 21 through the end of the chapter, verse 31. So it's just 11 verses that I want to read. But these verses are significant, and they're, they're huge. And it's, it paints a, we, we know of these verses. We've heard them many times. At least the last part, uh, uh, 20, 28 through 31. We hear those, we've heard that one a lot. But I want you to hear the whole context, verse 21 through 30. Isaiah chapter 40, 21 through 30. He asks the question, do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He, God, sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither. And a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all of these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting. The creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can tell. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even you grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run. Not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Today is the 15th anniversary of September 11th. And most of us um, can remember exactly where we were and what we were doing when the airplanes hit the towers. Um, I myself, I was already up that morning and had gone to the hospital because. Uh, a couple in our church were, were getting ready to have a baby and, and later on that afternoon uh, the baby was born. In fact, today the actual 15th uh, birthday of Matthew Busby, is that correct? So he was born on this day 15 years ago which was a tragic day in most respects but, but there were people that were born on that day right? And they look at that day as, hey, that's the day that, that life began for them. That was a joyful day for that family and excitement and things that, that happened. Um, in this church, in this, this service, Brother Jerry's birthday is today. So I can just imagine, Jerry, you remember what was going on that day because that day was already something special to you. And so, wow, your, your birthday is, I mean, 
Wow, all the events that take place. Leslie Corona, her birthday is today. And so in the Spanish church, we have someone with their birthday is on the day that it seems as if though everything stopped. Everything, chaos was ensuing because the world was falling apart and everybody seems to know where they were, exactly where they were, exactly what they were doing on that day. But I also remember the things that happened because of September 11th. As a nation, we were united. There, there might have been some fighting that took place before, but when September 11th happened, I mean, as a nation, Congress, they all came out. They were, they were showing a sign of their, uh, their, their unity and solidarity. They, they wanted to show the whole nation and the whole world that as a nation, we were together. There wasn't, there wasn't uh, different uh, faiths or different colors or different genders. Everybody was American uh, out of that. It was, it was something. Faith was important. And maybe it was, faith was important because on that day, people were, were afraid. Terror struck this nation uh, like it had, hasn't happened. And they were afraid. And maybe there, there was even some that would say that this was judgment from God. And, and all of a sudden, a nation began to cry out to God. And faith was something important uh, after this 9-11. And another thing that happened, and this was the most interesting thing, is we as a nation began to look at other people's needs instead of ours. And we were, we were selfless instead of being selfish. And I say that because uh, we were in a small town, Shadow, Oklahoma. But there were fire departments, police departments from all over the country that were traveling to New York City to help. There were people, normally you would give blood, uh, some give blood on a re regular basis, most of the people, they don't give blood, you know, except for maybe when there's a blood drive at, at school or in a community or, but I mean, people all around the country were just going to the blood places and giving blood and they wanted to do anything they could to help other people. Here's the stat. The world is a different place than it was 10 years ago, or 15 years ago. 15 years ago, we were united. Today, I, I don't think so much. Fifteen years ago, faith was important. Today, I don't think so much. Fifteen years ago, people were willing to do anything to help others. And today, it doesn't seem like it is so much. Isaiah chapter 40 when we read these verses two times, he asks the question, Do you not know? Have you not heard? You see, there was something big. There was something large that happened. But now the people find themselves in a different world. Now things have changed. A lot of things have changed since Jeremiah or Isaiah chapter 39. 195 years have gone by. And a lot of things have changed. And so he's asking them questions. Do you not know? Do you not know what happened? Have you not been told what happened? Are you clueless to the events that took place? What did the people not know? What have they not heard? And I think there are three things that Isaiah will pull out in these, these next few verses, these 11 verses. First of all, God is big. Secondly, we are small. And thirdly, God gives grace. God is big. We are small. God gives grace. That first idea, God is big. That's, sometimes we forget that, right? I, I forget a lot of things lately. And... Uh, in fact, this morning I got up a little bit late, 
I had to go do something real quick. I got I got here late and I left my phone at the house. Don't y'all hate it when you leave stuff and forget stuff? And I mean, if you want to hear the story of my day, it's been a it's been a very interesting day for me. And I just smile because I know that what I was going to preach on and it reminds me God is big, I am small <laughs> and God gets great right? Those are the things that reminded me today but, but this idea that God is big, Isaiah chapter 36 and you'll just look back at Isaiah 36 Isaiah 37 but what happens in Isaiah chapter 36, the Assyrian army has already defeated Israel has already marshaled them out and took them, taken them into captivity, and now they have surrounded Jerusalem. Um, the commander of that army sends Hezekiah a letter. Uh, the, the Jerusalem is surrounded. The Assyrian army has besieged it. There's, there's famine. There's all these kind of things that are taking place already because of the acts of war. And the commander of this Assyrian army sends Hezekiah the king a letter. And that letter simply says, you know what? The Assyrian army, my army, has defeated many nations. And all those gods of those nations, they couldn't stop our army. What makes you think that your God is going to be any different? What makes you think that you can trust God and, and he's going to help you out? Aren't, aren't, uh, isn't that the same God? that, that uh, uh, Israel had lost? Isn't that the same God that, that those, those little golden calves that were out there in Dan and, 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 and Samaria aren't those the same God that we wiped out? How, why do you put your trust in God? Is he going to save you? So all this letter that Hezekiah gets in, in Isaiah chapter 37, verse 14 through 17, Listen to what Hezekiah does. <coughs> Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and he read it. And then he went up to the temple of the Lord and he spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to all the words uh, Sinner Sheriff has sent to ridicule the living God. And so Hezekiah believed in his heart, believed in his mind that God was big. You're the God who created all of these things, and the Assyrian army has come against us, and they're so big, and they have been destroying all these other kingdoms and all their other gods. But you know what? Those aren't gods. You're the real God. You're the great God. You created all these things. Hear what he's saying. And so God listens to his prayer. You look in verse uh, Isaiah 37, verse 36. It says, Then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. And when the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead people. All the dead people. It was, it was amazing because, because God is big. You see, the Assyrian army was big. And they came against Jerusalem. And, and they, they wanted to strike fear. They wanted to strike terror. Give up. All the other kings have. Don't trust your God. All the other gods haven't been able to save them. But our God is a big God. Amen. Our God is a big God. And apparently, that message was not told to this people. Apparently, 195 years have gone by, and a generation has grew up that did not know that their God was the God who created the heavens and the earth, and he was a big God, and there's, there's no army that could stand against him. And so, Isaiah chapter 40, he, listen, listen to verse, verse 23. He brings princes to not and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted 
No sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither and their whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal? Says the Holy One. That's what God says to these people. Don't you know? Haven't you heard? All these nations, all these mighty kings, God pushes them away. God blows them away like chaff. They're nothing compared to God because God is big. God is big. And I think that's something that you and I need to remember today because you and I are going to face some great, great battles. And you and I are going to face some great enemies. And this is what you need to do with your prayer nightly is what, whatever big enemy that you're facing, whatever enemy is gathered around your wall and sends you a letter and tells you to give up and tells you not to trust in God, you need to remember, I got a big God. I got a big God. And if we don't pass that down, if we don't tell, then a generation will grow up and they'll not know. Just how big God really is. But the second thing I, I, I noticed in Isaiah, they didn't realize how small they were. You see, not only is God big, but we're small. We're small. Isaiah chapter 38, God, remember, God's big. God has completely wiped out this Assyrian army. Then Sheriff, he goes back, and, and he's even killed when he goes back. But now 38 comes along, chapter 38. Isaiah 38, verse 1 says, In those days Hezekiah became ill and was to the point of death. And the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order because you're going to die and you will not recover. You see, sometimes when, when you got this, I mean, the story there is amazing, right? Here's this great army that comes against Israel, or Judah. Hezekiah prays, and God, boom, God delivers. But it says, at that time, I mean, there's not a lot of time that goes by from when God delivers uh, Judah from Assyria, and all of a sudden, the one who prayed for this deliverance, he's now sick. And not just any kind of sick, he's sick to the point where God sends Isaiah the prophet to him and says, get your house in order because you're going to die and you're not going to recover. You see, one of the things that 9-11 will show us and that we all need to remember is life is precious and it can be gone just like that. Brother Paul is absolutely right. These guys got up that morning, they went to work, they had no earthly idea what was going to happen that day. And probably... A lot of them, I know we, we saw some that, that, that suffered and they were in torment in, in the building, but what about those that died instantaneously? I mean, I mean, it's just amazing, just right then, in a blink of an eye, their life was over. Life is so precious. We're so small in comparison, especially in comparison to who God is. Hezekiah, get your life in order. Listen to, listen to chapter 40, verse 22. I love, I love what yeah, haven't you heard. Um, don't you know? Listen to verse 22. He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. I mean, this is from God's perspective. You know, <laughs> The Twin Towers, from a man's perspective, they were huge because those were, those were as high as it got, right? There's larger towers now. But when we look at that, we say, wow, that's such a big thing. God's looking down, and we're so small. Life is just but a, it's just but a whisper. It, it, it's here today, and it's gone tomorrow. And we can never get into ourselves that we're, we're big. We can, we can never think that we're big. We're small. And God can, can, God can require your life even today. But that last thing, very interesting, God's a trick. You 
she once again has the kind of phrase. Isn't that interesting? Syrian army around the wall. He takes the letter, he spreads it out before the Lord, he prays. God hears his prayer, wipes out the Assyrian army, and now Hezekiah can think, wow, man, I'm pretty good, I'm pretty strong. And then all of a sudden, God says to him through Isaiah the prophet, get your house in order because you're not going to recover. And all of a sudden, he realizes that how small he is, how, how life is fleeting. And so he cries out to God again. In 38, chapter 38, uh, verse 2 and 3, it says, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, Lord, how I've walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. So he cries out to God. And God stops the prophet Isaiah. He didn't get very far. Maybe he didn't get very far because he was older. He's walking slower. But either way, he didn't get very far. And God says, hey, I've heard him. Go back and tell him. He's going to have 15 more years. 15 more years. What if God gave you 15 extra years? What would you do? What would you do if God gave you 15 years and said, hey, this is, you're going to have 15 more years to live. That's all you're going to have. If you, if you knew you were going to live 15 more years, not, not, not a year more, what would you do with that? Well, here's what Hezekiah does. Hezekiah says, Wow, the Assyrian army was gathered around me, and we beat them. Wow, I was sick, and I'm not sick anymore. It seems to me that I'm pretty, I'm pretty vul I'm, I'm, I'm invincible. I can't be stopped. Well, then all of a sudden, there's this. A big old group of people that come to Jerusalem. And they wanted to check this stuff out. And chapter 39 says that they came to Jerusalem and Hezekiah received them gladly and showed them what was in his storehouses. The silver, the gold, the spices, the fine olive oil, his entire armory and everything found among his treasure, there was nothing in his palace or in all his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. In other words, Hezekiah says, look how great I am. Look how, look how awesome I am. And he forgot it was God that delivered him. He forgot that it was God that healed him. And now he's saying, wow, look, look at me. He forgot. And sometimes we forget. Sometimes you and I, we forget. We make statements about this precious day of September 11th and this idea of never forget. Right? Never forget. Is it possible that we could forget that day? Is it possible? Isaiah the prophet comes to Hezekiah and asks, what did those men say when they were came to you? Where did they come from? Well, they came from a distant land, Hezekiah replied. They came to me from Babylon. The prophet asked, well, what did you they see in your house? They saw everything in my palace, as the guy said. There's nothing among my treasures that I did not show them. Listen to verse 5. This is chapter 39, verse 5 through 8, verse 5 through 7. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord Almighty. 
the time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors had stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you will be taken away and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. You see, chapter 39 is about this prophecy that in 125 years, 15 more years of your life, 110 more years of seven kings that will come after you, but in 125 years, something's going to happen. That same group of people that came and you showed them everything, that nation will come again and they'll take everything that you have. And Hezekiah says something. It says something that ought to scare every one of us. Verse 8, 39. It's the last verse of chapter 39. The last verse says, The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied. For he thought, There will be peace and security in my life. Everything will be fine. He goes, those things won't happen until I'm gone. 195 years later, you know why they didn't know God? Because no one ever told them. No one ever told them, our God's big. Our God's, God's big. It doesn't matter what enemy that you come against. Our God is a big God. 